Congratulations, you have just found the number one over 50 health and wellness podcast on the planet. In today's episode of the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show, we dive into a topic that's sparking a lot of curiosity and conversation among our listeners, and that's the unique challenges and strategies for those of us who identify as hard gainers. These are individuals over 50 who find it particularly tough to put on weight or muscle despite their best efforts. This is a subject that's very close to my heart personally, and it's especially relevant for our audience who are eager to transform their bodies and health in the second half of their lives. We're going to explore the myths, the science, and some personal stories behind being a hard gainer. And here's the best part. I'm joined today by an amazing co-host, none other than Silver Edge Super Coach Russell Medeiros. So if you're struggling to see the gains you desire, or if you're just curious about how to optimize your fitness journey after 50, this episode is packed with valuable information and motivation tailored just for you. Are you over 50 and sick and tired of the weight loss, weight gain roller coaster ride? Are you fed up with wacky workout routines and crazy cardio bouts? If the diets and workouts you've tried in the past have failed at building and maintaining a lean, strong, healthy body that you love, and you're ready to make a permanent change from a fat storer to a fat burning machine, then you might just be a perfect candidate for our six month one on one coaching service. Want to learn more? Head over to silveredgefitness.com and click on the coaching tab at the top of the page, or just shoot me an email at coach at silveredgefitness.com. Your future self will thank you. Coach Russell, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Good morning. Good morning. So let's, let's kick this off. Today, we're going to have some fun. I want to talk to you about a subject near and dear to my heart, and it's something that I get a little bit of. I've gotten a few questions about recently, so I thought we'd address it here in a podcast episode, and that's hard gainers. But before we get there, let's just back up here a little bit. Tell me, what's what's new with you? What's going on since we last spoke? Just life struggles. That's about it. Are you to that? Yeah. It's funny. You know how things go well for a while, and then all of a sudden, the rug gets pulled out under you, told yeah. to have to move, right? The, the selling the house I'm in. And, my kids love their neighborhood, and mm -hmm. so, the, you know, the stress just immediately pops in, and instead of letting it take over and going to the Oreos, I just took a walk, and what do you know? Three houses over, they're renting that one. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> oh, I'd never saw that sign before until today, and so my week of stress with kids being out of school and that all going on, once you calm down and take a walk, <laughs> things come. Thanks. Back into perspective, huh? <laughs> Back, back in, yeah. we're back in the normal swing of things now. Right on. Well, you mentioned going to the Oreos. Is that your go-to? We have a lot of Oreos here. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of Oreos there. Yeah. The kids, well, there's, kids there's like part the of Oreos. the problem right there. Yeah. 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 I need to get have young ones in the house. So. Yeah. yeah getting get rid of the kids. Around. That would help me out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so my, my go-to when I'm kind of stressed or just bored, basically, if I'm going to, if I'm going to stand and mindlessly snack in the pantry, it's going to be potato chips. That's my, oh, yeah. that's my weakness. Yeah. And not any of the fancy ones either. Just the plain salted, plain, no flavor. I don't want the cheese or barbecue or sour cream. None of that crap. I just want the plain, salty potato chips. That's Good funny. old fashioned ones. Yeah. I can smash it's hard to, those things. It's hard to stop with those too. It is hard to stop. Well, they are in fact scientifically engineered to be hard to stop. I, is it Lay's? It's their, I mean, their tagline is bet you can't eat just one. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Funny story. Years and years before I got really into nutrition, one day I ate like half a bottle. You know, remember the Nilla wafers? Oh, yeah. 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 You make banana pudding with Nilla wafers, yeah, of course. Yeah. They're air, right? They're air. Yeah, they, right. they don't have any ca no calories. calories. Those, yeah. Right. So I, I must have ate half a box. And then when I finally realized how to count calories and whatnot, I was like, I could have just went to in and out <laughs> Yeah. And a burger and fries. I would have right. been. I would have been well better off. <laughs> sure, sure. All right. the Nilla wafers I ate. Nilla wafers, yeah. That's just basically, what is that, flour and sugar? Butter? Or probably not butter even. It's probably some other shortening yeah. type thing. Some scientific thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not not good. Not well, good. Well, hey, man, uh, I got to tell you a story here. So here, you probably know, I'm, I'm on a little tiny farm, so 
my dad had like 20 acres out here in the country, just off of off the coast of Southern North Carolina, out here in Bolivia, North Carolina. And we originally bought this place. We lived at the beach. So we lived in Carolina Beach. And we bought this place a few years back. It had this little tiny 100-year-old house on it. And it was for us to just like have fun weekends. We'd come out. We'd visit with my dad. We'd hang out. We could stay the night in our little, our little we could play farmer, come out here to the country a little bit. And over time, this is now our permanent home. In fact, we ended up Airbnb in our place at the beach, and we finally just sold that completely. So we live here full time now. And I tell you what, I've got these chickens, right? So I think there's like 15, 16 of my hens, and I got one mean rooster. So I, I am in, I am well stocked with farm fresh eggs every day. And I, I love my chickens. And the funny thing is, last year, I there were the snakes found my chickens. Not so much the chickens, but they found the eggs. So these, you got to uh -huh. imagine a snake that's big enough because they swallow an egg whole. That's how they eat an egg. And I was catching these snakes in my in my chicken coop. And if you've ever caught a snake before, you got to be kind of, you know, you got to sneak up on them and then you grab them. You can grab them right behind their head so they can't bite you. Now, here where I live, there are poisonous snakes. We have, I've seen lots of water moccasins. I've seen a few copperheads and I've never seen, but there are apparently rattlesnakes here as well. Knock on wood, so far, these have only been non-venomous snakes. So I've got garter snakes, which they don't get very big. But the rat snakes and the kink snakes get freaking huge, man. And I actually went last year, because I had so many freaking snakes in my chicken coop, I went and got a professional snake catcher. So, you know, those, oh. have you ever seen those big, it's like a big, it's like a thing you pick up trash on the road with. It's yeah. It's a squeeze yeah. handle like that, and it's got a little yeah. jaw that meant to grab them right behind their head. I had to use it for the first time this year. The the snakes are already there. I was getting getting eggs out of my hen house the other day, and they they've got these little egg boxes, these little egg these little nests, right? These little that they're supposed to lay their eggs in, and most of the time that's where they lay their eggs. But there's one corner of the coop that they just love to, for whatever reason, they just love to lay eggs there. And they're like four eggs there. I'm like, oh sweet! I'm bending down and picking them up. And there's this, in my peripheral vision, there's this little motion next to my hand. Sure enough, there's a big old garter snake right there, nestled up right next to my eggs. I'm like, you son of a... So I grabbed my <laughs> snake catcher and got him out. First snake this year. So I, I, I'm too kind. I, I, I relocate them, meaning I walk over basically... My neighbor's not listening to this podcast, I don't think, but I, I walk over to his neighbor, over onto his property, and I chuck those snakes over there. I'm like, get out of here. But yeah, that's the first of probably many snakes I'm gonna go to battle with here this this summer. Uh, well, I'm glad you eggs, got the, I'm glad you got the catcher. We we don't want to lose you for yeah, right. Yeah, the snake catcher is <laughs> the way to go. Well, my yeah. wife one day out in the garden last year was convinced she heard a rattles a rattlesnake. She came running. In, There's a rattlesnake. There's a rattlesnake. I grabbed my shotgun. I went running. Where is he? Where is he? She goes. Well, I didn't see him. I heard him. I said, Okay, where'd you hear him? Where'd you hear him? And we were all really quiet. We're listening. We never did hear him. So I don't know if she really heard a, a giant rattlesnake or what was what the commotion was. But we got we have lots of never a dull moment out here, I guess. No, yeah, never. never. That's that's awesome. I heard a lot of people moving toward like farm type of style of living, especially people out here in the city. It's, yeah, no, it's. I am really, really surprised. I love the beach. Been a surfer all of my adult life, most of my adolescent life as well. A uh, huge fisherman. I, at times I've owned, you know, now I, I actually, this is the first time in 20 something years I haven't owned a boat, but I've had many different fishing boats. I, I just feel a deep connection to the sea. And I really thought it'd be fun to be out here next to my dad and to be out here in the country a little bit. I was raised on a big farm as a kid, but I'm really surprised at how much I love it out here and how much I really don't miss. I, didn't, I don't miss the beach as much as I thought I would. For one, it's it's beautiful in the summertime, but I've watched my little beach, Carolina Beach in particular in North Carolina, just go from being in the 80s, this very sleepy little beach town to now something much, much different. And it's overrun yeah. in the summer by tourists and just a whole different scene, right? But I don't. I think something probably shifted during COVID, really, and just this idea of being back on the land, having some self reliance. We're on a well, right? So I've got water no matter what. I've got. Huh, I've now got I think eleven or twelve big old garden beds, raised garden beds. So I'm going full scale on on the gardening here. I've got my chickens, so I've got compost from them. My dad 
and stepmom across the street have got llamas. So I got lots of llama beans, which if you don't know, llama beans are pure garden gold when it comes to compost. So I got a lifetime supply of that. So we're, we're hitting the permaculture hard out here. Oh, that's pretty interesting. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. man. So if you're starting up, but there's a tip for you folks out there that are gardeners. If you know anybody that's got a llama farm, there's, and you got access to some llama beans, llama manure. That's that's the way to go, man. I think anyway, I, have, I don't think we have any out here. <laughs> yeah, well, the, look, hunt, they're, they're not indigenous to where I am either. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I got to ask you here. By the time this airs, this will probably be old news. But have you been following it all? All this craziness with with Andrew Huberman in the news no. here lately. I know who he is, but really, not, been yeah. All right. So for folks that don't know, I mean, Andrew Huberman, he's a he's a very famous he's a now he's a I mean, he's a neuroscientist. Right. So brilliant, brilliant dude. He's got the Andrew Huberman podcast. I think it's the Huberman Lab podcast is what it's called. He's got like, I think, six million Instagram followers, probably that many on on YouTube as well. Really, really sharp dude. Um, wildly, massively popular podcast. But at any rate, we're recording this. What is this? It's Friday, March 29th. This will this be a couple of weeks before this comes out. But the New York Magazine just did a big, and when I say big, I mean long-ass article on Andrew Huberman. And the only reason I know that is because it's all over social media. It's like, oh, Huberman is, you know, he's this. it's basically kind of a smear piece, I guess. I mean, it's really, really bizarre. Mm. So basically the gist of the article... By the way, I, I found the New York Magazine article. I tried to read it, and about 20 minutes in, I just I was like, man, I can't read anymore. This is like, it's it's like a novel. It's a really, really, really long article. But the gist of it is this. It's written by this lady, and it is written in this way that kind of, it's trying to cast him in a, in a bad light. And to me, this is just cancel culture at its worst. So the gist of it for folks that don't know and haven't seen this, or maybe you've read the headlines and you're thinking, oh, that guy's a real asshole. The gist of it is this. He seems to, he's a single dude as far as I can tell. And I think he was dating like five women at once. And so that's the, that's the whole, you know, everybody thinks Andrew Huberman's this wonderful guy, but he's really this devious, manipulative womanizer or something. And it goes on. I mean, it's really, really odd because you would think by the headlines that there's this revelation that, hey, this this Huberman guy, he's not all he's cracked up to be. Well, A, he's, I mean, it's not like he's a, a monk or a preacher that's taken a vow of celibacy and has been caught out. I mean, he's a wildly popular, single, good-looking, very intelligent man. And if he's dating five, six ladies at once, I guess that's kind of his prerogative. Is I mean, it'd be kind of shitty if he was, if each one thought they were in an exclusive relationship with him. But at any rate, there's other odd pieces in the article that goes on to say, well, he's been known to have flaky behavior. Sometimes he says he's going to show up for things and doesn't. And you're like, well, wait, I think everybody on the face of this That's earth everybody. has, <laughs> yeah, I'm, heck, I did that last week, right? You know, I'm supposed to go to so many parties that I've yeah, never right? been to. <laughs> Sure, I'll be there. You know, I've got yeah. intentions to be there. But it, it, anyway, it was just this really weird I don't know how to describe it. It seems to me as if, because there's this, the the narrative is this one lady who was in a relationship with him, who they don't name, by the way, they say her name, this is not her real name. So Sarah, I think that's what they call her in the article. And it's all about Sarah's side of the story, right? Well, he, he was, he was controlling and manipulative. And then later I found out he was seeing some other people and it was just this very odd, odd article. And it, it seems almost as if this, this, Sarah lady, this unknown, unnamed lady was best friends. Her, her BFF was the author of this, of this article and her, her BFF said, Hey, don't worry. I'll write an article for you. And then in the New Yorker, and we'll, we'll get this guy. We'll, we'll get this Andrew Huberman guy, but really weird more on that kind of, I feel like the cancel culture kind of side of things. If you're a Huberman fan, here's my take on it. If you're a Huberman fan, you dig his podcast, you, you like following him on, on social media. I, I mean, having read three quarters of that article just because I couldn't stomach anymore. It was so boring and repetitive and, frankly, long. That I just couldn't make it all the way to the end. Maybe there was a bombshell revelation in the last paragraph, and I just didn't get that far. But from what I could read, I mean, I don't know. The dude doesn't take anything away from his brilliance. And 
Go ahead. It's not like he's giving relationships. It's not like he, it'd be yeah, one thing if he, he is, yeah, yeah, it's one thing if he said, you know, marriage is the holy, you know, right, and this is right. the, you know, yeah. and, and it's funny how we we do it with our athletes too. You know, we use them as role models. Right, they're a good basketball player. They might yeah. be a horrible human being. Correct, they're a great basketball player, yeah. right? So, yeah. it's just funny how we we try to interweave all this stuff. Yeah, into, it is. Yeah, I don't care what he does at home. Like, yeah, right. In his personal, I'm not life. going to him. I'm not going to him for that. <laughs> and look, if anybody were to dig deep enough into my background, they could find all kinds of crap. I'm sure Please. you could go find some of my exes. I mean, it would be a long, long time ago, but some of them might not have some such flattering things to say about me, right? I mean, it's it's yeah. just really, really odd. And I saw these headlines of, does this you know, claims against his credibility? And it's just it's just weird. But at any rate, for me, I find this cutting edge neuroscience stuff to be incredibly fascinating, but I don't find it to be particularly, a lot of it to be particularly practical, right? So I dig Huberman, yeah. and when he has a subject on that I like, I will listen. The dude's brilliant. He communicates really, really well. He doesn't talk down to people. He, you know, he, he talks as peers. He, I mean, he's an excellent communicator, great podcast. But a lot of it's just like, I mean, he gets into the weeds. Remember you and I were talking a few weeks ago about the boulders and the, yes. the big rocks, the little rocks and the pebbles. I mean, this dude is, you know, he's a, he's a neuroscientist. He's into all these studies about, you know, well, this, if we do this and this and this, and we'll get a 5% increase in this. And he spends a lot of time down there in the weeds. And I, you know, I think that for somebody who maybe doesn't have their diet dialed in, if you're still eating a lot of processed foods, or if you're not working out or walking or hydrating or getting eight hours of sleep, Maybe some of that advanced neuroscience stuff isn't as applicable, but it sure is fun. That's that's my take on that. I mean, take anyway, bits and pieces. Take bits and pieces from it too. Take bits and pieces, yeah, and apply what yeah, apply what like works. Everything else. But yeah. he's a big jack dude. Oh, and by the other the other thing I learned about Andrew Huberman just reading the article is he is forty eight, so he's only two years away from being a silver edger himself. Yeah, be a client. <laughs> he can be a client. Dude's pretty big and jacked. I don't know, man. I'm not sure what I could teach him. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to program for him though. All righty. Speaking of big and jacked, what I wanted to talk today about is hard gainers. And I guess before we start our conversation here, talking about hard gainers, we should, I guess, define for folks that maybe aren't familiar with that term what a hard gainer is. And I'll start, and then Russell, I'll just ask for you to add any commentary here. But basically, a hard gain, hard gainer is. A person, a man or a woman, it's often referred to as men, but I've known women that fall into this category that find it hard to put on size. They find it hard to gain weight. They find it hard specifically to build muscle. So, Russell, have you, I mean, you've been coaching for a long time. Have you worked with hard gainers or people that would fall into this category? Yeah. So I'll add on to your explanation. Sure. For those of us who look at food and gain weight. Right. The hard gainer is the annoying person that eats everything <laughs> and doesn't put on any weight. That's for yeah. us, us folks. But yes, I have. It's surprising. Sometimes they're harder than the weight loss people. Yeah, I just agree. Just because the amount of food you have to eat. Right. Yeah. Well, so yeah, that you you bring up a good point. When we a lot of times when we talk about hard gainers, because look, seventy percent of our population now is either overweight or obese. And these people are rolling their eyes probably in disgust when they think about somebody like me. I identify personally as a hard gainer, as somebody who has a hard time gaining weight. They're like, what the, are you kidding me? <laughs> Your problem is you have a hard time gaining weight. I don't, I don't want to hear that. Uh, but I do think that this is an interesting conversation to have because there's a couple of reasons, uh, one is hard gainers, kind of a real thing. And the other is that we have this, I think we have this epidemic of skinny fat people right now. And yeah. some of them fall into this category. Some of them maybe identify as kind of hard gainers. Most of them probably just are in that skinny fat condition just because of lifestyle, right? And less, mm -hmm. you know, we think of a hard gainer, we think about somebody who's actively trying to put on muscle and struggling to do that as opposed to most of our skinny fat. So that's kind of going to be our distinction between skinny fat and hard gainer. But the advice we're going to give is probably going to work for both of these populations. All right. So people may have heard of 
these body types, right? This this ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. And basically the idea is, is that you kind of have this genetic predisposition towards one of these body types. In other words, this is home base for you. It's not to say you can't change. I've known people who have claimed to have been all three of these in their life. So certainly you can you can change your body type. But classically, an ectomorph is that skinny person, that person that, like you said, they eat and eat and eat, never seem to, to gain any weight. That's our ectomorph. Our mesomorph are more those middle of the road people. They usually have, you know, they've got the more desirable bodies in terms of muscle composition. And then you got your endomorphs. And these are the people, Russell, like you mentioned, you know, man, I look at food and I gain weight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. it's, you got that kind of that body that just seems to have that preference. So we have those, those three body types. And what we're going to talk about today are these ectomorphs, these hard gainers. And what I want to do today is just come up with a few tips for those of you out there that either are ectomorphs, that you know ectomorphs, and you can kind of maybe share this episode with, or maybe you fall into that skinny fat camp, right? You've got a, a skinny frame, but very little muscle mass on you. I think all the things we're going to talk about here today would, would apply to those folks as well. So, <laughs> Russell, I'm going to tell you, I, I think you know, I've shared this a little bit with you, but I'm going to, tell, I'm going to start by telling my story of my, my mission to put on some serious muscle last year. So about... Gosh, a little over a year ago, we had Adam Schaefer, who is one of the co-hosts at Mind Pump On, and he was a great guest. Loved talking to him. And the subject or the title of that podcast was something like, "So you want to be a you want to train like a bodybuilder?" Something like that, right? And it inspired me because I've never really done serious bodybuilder style training, which means eating a lot of food and lifting a lot of weights and trying to specifically to bulk up. So in the bodybuilding world, we have this concept of bulking and cutting, right? So bulking is going to be what it sounds like you're going to eat in a calorie surplus, and you're going to really try and make those excess calories build some muscle. And then when you cut, the idea is you're going to, you're going to build muscle, you're going to build some fat, but then you're going to go into this cut phase, this diet phase, you're going to strip away the fat and just be left with the muscle. So that's the theory, right? <laughs> and that's the, that's, the, that's the gold standard for body transformation when you look at that these bodybuilders. So last January, February, sometime in there, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. And here's what I did, Russell. I ate like a bodybuilder for, I don't know, pretty much up until Christmas last year. Yeah. I mean, I pushed my, I pushed my calories. I, at one point I was eating in excess of 4,000 calories in, in December I was eating like 42, 4,300 calories, and it was difficult wow. for me to eat that much food. I was literally, are you ready for this? I literally went into the grocery store, went to the ice cream aisle, and I chose my ice cream on the calorie density. I ended up with a gelato. It was, I think, Talenti's peanut butter cup. I chose the flavor, the brand, and the fact that it was gelato, all based on calories per serving. You know why? At the end of the day, I'd eat my dinner, I'd be stuffed and I'd be like yeah. 600 calories short of my goal, 800 calories short of my goal. But you know what? I could have there no matter how full you are, yeah. there's room for ice cream, right? It always is, yeah. So, guess what happened? I'm going to say body fat more than muscle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, body fat more than muscle. I so just for frame of reference, I can I should I should have checked my numbers here. I was one ninety, I was probably low one nineties when I started this. My goal was to get to like two fifteen, which if oh, I wow. stopped and thought about that's a stupid goal. That, there's no way I was going to gain that much that's muscle. Yeah, I got dude, I got to two ten though. Wow. Yeah, the end of right at the right before Christmas, my highest weigh in was I think two hundred nine point eight. Go ahead and round up and say I hit two ten. <laughs> For a year, almost a year. Yeah, half ass. But yeah, yeah, yeah. What, well, let me back up. Here's where I went really, really wrong. For about six months, I said I was going to train like a bodybuilder, and I didn't really. I'm, mm. you know, I'm a hard gainer, and I'm just making excuses. I'm busy. I didn't really hit the gym that much, and I wasn't serious about my calories. And I was like, oh crap, you know, I 
Now I've only got six months left. I better get, I better, I need to get serious. So I got back into my fitness pal. I was recording everything. I was like, all right, maintenance calories about 3,500. Let's bump them up, baby. And here's the deal. And we're going to talk about this in a minute, right? About what's a, what's a realistic or good goal of weight gain for our hard gainers. But I noticed that the scale wasn't really moving. So I said, you know, I, let's, wow. let's make things happen. I got impatient. And I just started, I just dumped on the calories. But meanwhile, I wasn't really doing, I stopped doing all cardio because I wanted to lose, I wanted to gain weight, right? Yeah. Dude, yeah, I, I ended up putting on, I put on way more fat than I did muscle. <laughs> I put some muscle on, don't get me wrong. In December, I was stronger than I am now. Yeah. At any rate, I've been, so I've been paying for it. I've been cutting basically for the last almost two months. So I'm down now eating around 2,400 calories right now. And which is pretty low for me. That's like a thousand below my normal maintenance calories for me. Wow. And I went from 210. My weigh in today, I think, was 193. So I've lost a I've lost lost a lot of weight. But my fear is is that basically what I did was make myself fat and unhealthy. It was a push. <laughs> in the back half of last year. <laughs> and then dieted down to right where I was when I started this whole freaking thing a year ago. So I like to say there are no, you know, there's no failure in health and fitness. There's there's learning opportunities. Now, I got a question for you. Sure. Do you think it would have been different if you had some accountability? Yes. So yeah. I should have had a coach. I should have just said, Russell, will you coach me through this? Is what I should have done. Right. It's funny. I, I bring that up. I, like I tried to impress a coach that I've never met. Like when I started, when I was doing it, when I first yep. got a coach and I was like, what do I care what this guy thinks? But I was so deep into <laughs> Yeah. Doing the right thing for him, not for me. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, as coaches, you and I were joking about, you know, how different movements that we don't like. And I brought up the the Bulgarian split sh split squat. It's like, oh, yeah. funny how that never ends up in my programming when I program for myself, right? It's weird. It's weird. I haven't done that in a really long time. wonder why that it's is. It's really weird. Because I don't like it, so I don't program it for myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I should do, right? I think the same is true with, you know, I'm a coach, but I probably shouldn't coach myself and that. So yeah, that's a good point. That's a, that's another lesson learned. I should have been more patient and I damn sure should have worked out harder. I got lazy and I made the excuse that a lot of us do. I'm, I'm busy, man. I'm growing this business and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. All excuses, all excuses. Yeah. yeah. But at any rate, I turned 60 here and just by the time this airs and probably just a, a week or two. And my goal was to roll in to my 60s with a six pack, be sub 10% body fat. So I'm, I'm getting closer to that. But I can tell you what, in January, I was not anywhere close. I, I'll tell you this too. I told this to one of my clients the other day. Uh, I got a good chuckle. I was sitting on the bed. So not my best posture, right? For, you know, looking swollen, jacked. Oh, yeah. I'm sitting, just sitting on my bed. I can't remember what I was. I don't know. I was probably looking at my phone or something. My wife came up, slaps me on the belly and says, get kind of fat there, aren't you, babe? I was like, oh, oh, oh. go ahead. Just stick the dagger in my heart and that's... give it a twist. So anyway, that's when, just so you know, that's when I started my cut. <laughs> I was that's... like, oh, okay. Damn it. You want to hear. But here's, here's why I want to talk about kind of this hard gainer ectomorph. My childhood, I was always a skinny kid. And yeah. I could very much relate to the kid in the Charles. Remember those old Charles Atlas ads in the back of comic books oh, yeah. where uh -huh. big, mean, buff kid comes and kicks sand in the skinny On kid's the beach, face. Yeah. yeah, and he steals his girlfriend. You're like, damn, yep. man, that's hard. Yep. Well, I was that skinny kid. So still in the back of my mind, I'm a grown-ass man now. <laughs> and I'm no longer that skinny kid. But that that psychic trauma, I guess, kind of follows me around. And so I've got this got this kind of fear of being skinny. So I'm always kind of chasing, man, I'd like to be jacked. I'd like to be swole, right? And I think that drives a lot of people that fall into that ectomorph and hard gainer camp. You know, a lot of people, their insecurity is being fat. I don't want to be fat. And of course, now look, I've been fat. I've not been very obese, but I've certainly in my 40s at my unhealthiest, I was carrying a lot of weight. And unlike this January when I got up to 210, I was probably 210 then, but with no muscle, like none, yeah. like zero, like just all fat. So just not, not a healthy or a good look, but still for me, the psychology of that is, oh man, I don't want to be, I don't want to be skinny. Right. At any rate. So 
Let's talk a little bit about what somebody who finds himself in this kind of as, as, as maybe self-identifies as a hard gainer. And I'm going to start here with the workouts. So if you fall into the this hard gainer camp, if you identify as somebody that just has a hard time building muscle, you must do strength training. And you must do strength training in the classic sense of strength training. So I think a lot of people you know, get caught up in, you know, they, they consider strength training things like classes, right? So I go to a, I go to a, a class yeah. where we do weights as a class and there's, you know, we get after it. They do a lot of cardio. They do maybe hit, they do these boot camp style things. And that's the opposite of what's going to help somebody that's in that hard gainer, skinny fat camp, right? You're probably not yeah. going to put on a decent amount of muscle doing that. Well, it's like Russell. Uh, I know you've got experience working with clients that have been in exactly the same boat, right? Where they're they're oh, yeah. just getting after it, getting after it, getting after it. And going, man, why, why am I not putting on muscle? It's the CrossFit's a great example, right? You got these jack dudes in the CrossFit games, and you're yeah. like, well, look at them; they're doing all that. Yeah, they well, are. No, they yeah. did. They did something else to get that jack, mm. and then they pursued another goal, and that was CrossFit. And the same thing with the. You know, the, your boot camp, you, you see a lot of these like hybrid athletes yep. and it makes it seem like they're doing all that at one shot, right? I'm running a marathon. I'm also lifting weights. I'm also doing this and I'm jacked. Well, you know, they went down a path to get jacked and then right. they went down a path that you're right. So yeah. yeah, I think that, I think what we see in media, social media is not, doesn't help out the the average person, right? The average, yeah. Especially the average person in our age group, the average 50 and 60 year yeah. old. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So when we talk about strength training, we're talking about a very classic three to five days a week of mm -hmm. three to five sets of, I guess, three to 15 reps of weightlifting with rest periods in between. So very classically, if you look at what bodybuilders typically do, right, it's three sets of 10 with a minute, yep. 60 seconds of rest in between, and you're looking for that progressive overload. In other words, if and I'm doing back squats at 200 pounds for three sets of 10 this week, next week I want to do three sets of 11, the next week I'm going to do three sets of 12, and then maybe the next week I want to add another 20 pounds on there and drop back down to, but we're, we're really pushing the load there. And that rest is a really, that rest in between sets is a really key component of building muscle, right? I think a lot of mm -hmm. people miss that. You're like, well, that's just wasted time in the gym, man. If I did some jumpy jacks in between my sets, yes. I, I'll get even more jacked. And that's not yeah. the case, is it? Yeah. No, not at all. Not it's at all. funny how, how many people think that. Yep. Yep. And I'll say this, there is, uh, there's, this is a spectrum, right? When we talk about volume, frequency, and intensity. Those are, as coaches, those are the programming variables that we use along with exercise selection, of course. And there's this bell curve of gains. And those of you that are listening, I'm, I'm, I'm making a motion of a bell curve here. But you got this bell curve. And along the bottom axis is going to be, let's just say, volume, frequency, and intensity multiplied together, right? There's this total workload. <clears throat> And across that top axis is going to be your results, so the gains. And the sweet spot is right in the middle of that bell curve. In other words, if you don't do enough work, you're not going to get maximum gains. But if you do too much work, yeah. you're not going to get maximum gains. You've got to find that. And for everybody, it's a little bit different, right? We all have different recovery genetics and different exercise history. So you've got to find that sweet spot for you right in the middle where you're getting enough stimulus to to elicit muscle growth, but you're not overtraining. Would you agree? A hundred percent. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's a, a, a difficult place to be in, especially when you're, you have that mindset, push, 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 you right. know, and for me, it's like, I have to back off and really back off when I back off. So it, it's, I have to find that fine line for myself. It's, I enjoy the gym. And then I, you know, I still have that mentality of, oh, the more I do, the better off it's going to sure. be. And, you know, so when yeah, I do these yeah. shorter the workouts, right. yeah, I do these shorter workouts. I'm like, okay, I'm going mm -hmm. to the gym. It's going to be mobility. <laughs> it's right. going to be something that, you know, yeah. just like, so yeah, 
it's like you you're saying it's something each individual person has to figure out right because what's too much for me might not be enough for you correct Vice correct versa. it is highly individual and it's counterintuitive too because i think most things in life the harder i work the more the rewards are right so yeah yeah this, this is a little different because not necessarily in the gym so good point and then Keeping on the workout side of things, another tip for you hard gainers is never, ever, ever skip leg day. That's the biggest bang for your buck are those heavy squats and all the squat variations, <laughs> split stance, lunges, all of those, and heavy deadlifts. That's the biggest bang for your buck for a couple of reasons. One is just muscular, right? When you do a heavy deadlift, there's not a muscle in your body that's not engaged doing that, right? So these big, heavy compound lifts, you can get really heavy, but it's not just that every single muscle is involved. It's also that's sending the loudest muscle building signal there is to the central nervous system, right? If I'm doing some curls or some tricep push downs, fantastic exercises, by the way, they're not sending the same signal to the body in those are isolation exercises. So make sure you have a good combination of those, just your basics, your heavy rows, your heavy pushes. So that'd be an overhead press or a bench press, heavy barbell rows or dumbbell rows. Make sure you're doing lots of squats, lots of deadlifts, hip hinges, stuff of that nature. So um, yeah, when I program, I never start off with a bicep curl or anything. Like right. It's always a compound movement first. Right. And same. You know, those, I just did a powerlifting one. I haven't done a curl in, I don't know when, you know, <laughs> a yeah. bicep curl. So it's, it yeah, no, powerlifters don't do a whole lot of bicep curl, no, do they? No. no, but they get pretty big and strong. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which was to say. But it, it, yeah. hundred percent. And then my last workout tip for you folks. So first is we try to skip the classes. Do class, do more classical bodybuilding style training. Don't overtrain. Be mindful of that. You want to make sure that you get the right dose. Never, ever skip leg day. And then go easy on the cardio. So basically what, I, what I'll tell folks, especially as they're, they're ready to try something different and get serious about being on, you know, putting on some muscle, is walking is your new cardio. While you're in this phase of really trying to build muscle, you don't want to be doing a ton of hit. You don't want to be taking, you know, be doing Peloton classes or other things. You, let's make sure we're getting lots and lots and lots of walking. Hours is fine, but you don't want to constantly be hammering yourself with jogging, running, you know, any, any of the excess cardio type stuff. Would you agree to that for hard gainers? A hundred percent. What I often find is they try to explain how non-intensive their workout is, their their cardio. So mm -hmm. I have a great example. I had one person say, well, I take spin class and that's not hard. And I said, oh, really? I said, yeah. so is your bike designed with a basket up front and a bell? And they looked at me oddly and I said, are you standing up on the bike? That's intensive. Like, yeah. You can't go to a spin class and just casually yeah. stroll through the no. thing. Right. <laughs> So yeah. it's funny, we tend to lie about what, what we're doing to ourselves, you know. And 100%. Yeah, yeah you got to back off. But. Yeah, got to go easy on that at least. And look, there's, there's phases in your life. There's phases, you know, we yeah. periodize training as, as coaches and trainers. We periodize your training. And when you're in a bulk, when you're in a muscle building phase, probably not the best time to be hammering yourself or it's not the best time to be hammering yourself with, with cardio type stuff. All right, Russell, that's that's my tips there for workout. Anything else you could think of for folks out there that you've worked with that might fall in this camp from a workout perspective? You know, usually most of them enjoy working out, so that's probably most of the hardest do, yeah. thing is pull, pull, pulling the reins back up. Pulling the reins right. back. Or, yeah, or right. focusing that's... them on, on the goal we, we're trying to yeah, achieve. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So folks that are so most, that most of the hard self identify like. as self as as hard gainers, you're right. They more often we're pulling them back. In fact, I just this wasn't a client, this is just a friend who was asking for some advice. And when I said, Hey man, what what do your workouts look like? What is your what he he is currently tracking his calories? And he's like, Yeah, I'm eating about eighteen hundred calories. This is a pretty big dude. Not in the hard gainer camp, but somebody who's trying can't figure out why he's not able to lose a little fat and he's just not getting stronger, putting on any muscle, but eating eighteen hundred calories. And doing a six day a week gym split where he goes, he said, "Yeah, I go hard. I, I go to failure yeah. every, every every session." I'm like, all right, this is gonna be the easiest coaching session ever. Go to three days well, a week of full body workouts, 
don't take any of those lifts to failure. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, eat some damn food. He's like, yeah, but I'm trying to lose this, this last little bit of fat. I'm like, you know what? Look, do this for a month and then go back doing this crazy extreme stuff. He's a younger dude, so he can get away with being a little more extreme here. But yeah, yeah uh, I, I, that going hard every day is unfortunately, and you know, a lot of people actually love that. That's you know, gym life, right? You're just not going to get. I love, I love that you say it's easy coaching. I think it's the most difficult because to get it, to get it's it almost like it's yeah, to, to, to listen, to give, but yeah, yeah, to very easy advice to give, like that. Yeah, yeah, to make them do point. it, you're like, that yeah, you get to check in on them. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> get yeah, out of you're gym. right. It could be tougher <laughs> to get that guy or gal to pull back than it is to get somebody unmotivated to get their butt in the gym, right? Yeah. Two different two different sides, 100%. All right. Well, Russell, far and away, the, as you might guess, anybody listening, the biggest lever we have when it comes to these poor hard gainers just can't seem to put on mass is diet. It's nutrition. Yeah. It's being in a calorie surplus. So my advice for anybody in this camp is the same as I would tell anybody, whether you're a hard gainer or not. And that's first things first, take a week, just eat the way you normally are. Don't change anything. Track, weigh, measure all of your food for at least a week. And then get that daily average. How, figure out exactly how many calories a day you're eating. That's your maintenance calories, providing you're not currently like losing weight or gaining weight rapidly. I'm going to assume that your weight is relatively stable. That's your maintenance calories, right? So you take a week's worth of your calories. You take each day, you add those all together. That's your weekly calorie load. And you divide that number by seven. So that gives you your daily average. And let's just say it's 2000, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what we know right now, if you're trying hard to gain muscle and you're not doing it, you're under eating, whatever that number is, whether that number is 1800, 2800, doesn't really matter. You're not eating enough food. So I would recommend, all right, let's bump that up 10 to 20% for that first jump. So if you're eating 2000 calories, let's bump that up to 22, 20, somewhere between 22, 2400 yeah. calories, right? Seem fair, nice conservative bump. The reason we don't just ask you to eat 3,000 calories is a couple things. One, that's going to be really hard for some people to do, right? If you're a woman eating 2,000 calories trying to gain some muscle, and I say eat 3,000, that's going to be really, really tricky to do. And 100%, you're going to gain more fat than muscle by taking that that big of a jump. So just that that conservative bump, you're going to stay there for one week, two weeks, three weeks, start feeling good there, and then you're going to bump it again. So we're going to continue to bump this. And the idea is we want to move your maintenance calories from being, in our example, 2,000 to being some other higher number, right? But mm -hmm. here's the deal. We don't build muscle out of thin air, right? We build it from a building blocks. So we build it from amino acids, which we get from the protein in our diet. And we, we need this fuel in order to these building blocks, these foundational bricks, if you will, to build this muscle. So you've got to have that on board in order to build the muscle. And that's, that's where the calorie surplus comes in. A lot of people miss that very basic fact that in order to build muscle, especially in a, in a already conditioned person, somebody who's got a history of lifting weights, got to be in a, a calorie surplus, right? Yeah. Sometimes the hardest thing to do, like you were saying earlier, it's wise to build it slowly, just like everything else. You know, like yep. when we do a diet, we do it slowly, we don't just right. slash you a thousand calories but yeah the tricky part is like you said getting in the food you know so you're not just adding ice cream and you know things just just <laughs> dense food just to yeah, get in you want there, it to be whole know? foods people yeah you don't want yeah. to be relying take it from me you don't want to be relying on ice cream to hit your calories at the end of the night that doesn't convert to muscle very well unfortunately <laughs> at least in my experience we haven't found that and that to be true. No, nope, I found that to be true. Yet, dang it! If I can, yeah. if I can just figure out how to eat ice cream and get swollen, jacked, I'll, I'll let you know. But so far, that's been an unsuccessful experiment. Yeah, but with my hard gainers, I do allow them more. You know, yes, they a have a little more, more food freedom, freedom too. Yeah, yeah more one hundred percent. Yep. I don't know about you. Were you? Did you? Like you had to use processed foods to get you up that high right like 100 percent, i did yeah so i was doing a lot of yeah. i was trying to you know i was doing 200 and between 210 and two, 210 220 grams of protein a day so i was doing a minimum of two shakes a day 
And yes, I was relying on some processed foods to get me there. Sp yeah. Most specifically, at the end of the night, if I if I was if I was close to you know if I was only a couple hundred, I would just eat some more starch or meat typically. But when I missed it by six eight hundred calories at the end of the night, and I was like, oh man, which brings me to my next point for hard gainers it's critical to hit to be consistent with your calories so let's just say you've decided hey i'm eating 2000 calories my new calorie goal is 2300 unlike in a cut where if you're let's say you're cutting to 2300 calories as long as you average that over a week you're in a calorie deficit for the week things will things will work out just fine when you're in a calorie surplus the math works a little bit different you don't have the luxury of missing a day, like say this day I, I got busy and I only ate 1,800 calories, that's okay. Tomorrow I'll eat you know, 2,800 calories and it'll, it'll even out. No, it won't. You're missing this, 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 that, that day's muscle building potential when you under eat in that day. So it's really, really important for you hard gainers to really, really dial in that, those calories and be really, really consistent. Don't under eat on any of those days. Think of it this way. Every day you under eat is a missed opportunity for building muscle in that day. So, yeah. uh, but really got to be consistent. And then of course we can't have this conversation without, of course, we talk about protein all the time and our protein recommendations for hard gainers is the same for anybody else. It's the same for the person that's 100 pounds overweight and wants to lose weight. It's to eat that 0. 0.7 to 1 gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. So for you hard gainers, that's going to be a bigger number than what you are today. And for hard gainers, probably closer to that 1 gram of, of protein per pound of ideal body weight. Yeah, I find a lot. I was going to ask you, were you more higher carb or higher fat? I was more higher carb. And now in my cuts, for me personally, I, I process carbs just fine. Love my carbs. But that's what I cut. When I go into my cut, I cut out the carbs first. So I'm very, I'm very close to yeah. keto carnivore right now because I'm not eating very many carbs. And I still feel pretty good. I don't feel great in the gym. I feel weak in the gym. In fact, yeah, I'm going to tell you this yeah. embarrassing story, Russell, right now. Were you using the pink weights? Dude, <laughs> almost. So I go, I, I'm a member in a couple different gyms, right? I've got yeah. this big, fancy, amazing one, but it's far away. And then there's this little hole in the wall one here, kind of a little closer to me because, again, I'm out, in the, out here in the boondocks. And the little, little, the little tiny one in the strip mall has got some incredibly strong people in there. And when I go in, there's, there's these two gals that are in their ladies, women, they're young women. I have crappy ages, but I, I would guess they're not 30 yet. They're probably in their twenties. Um, and they are fabulously, fabulously fit. One of them I know is a, a bodybuilding competitor. I'm not sure about if the other one is she's, but they're both really strong. I was getting ready to go over and do my, my dumbbell shoulder presses and the dumbbells that I was going to use currently in use by one of those ladies. She was over there freaking repping out dumbbell shoulder presses, the same exercise I was getting ready to do with the same weight I was getting ready to do. I thought to myself, well, holy moly, I'm going to go do a different exercise because there's no way I can wait for her to put those down, walk up right behind her, grab the exact same wet, exact same weight and start doing them. Oh man, it was just a little demoralizing. Now let's hope. I could say okay. she's a she's a short thing, right? She's got smaller lever yeah. levers. I'm six foot two. I got these big long ape arms, and that's a piss poor excuse, man. No, nah, she was using the same weight that I was. <laughs> what what's hilarious about that? So I, I've been in the same position, right? Where yeah, yeah, I have a different goal, right? So my goal wasn't to throw on massive weights, and right, right now I'm doing something that's basically mostly body weight movement. So I, I had the same thing. I was working on some my little sh shoulder rehab type thing so i was in the gym and of course i picked up the lightest dumbbell and i'm doing this thing and yeah i'm struggling because it hurts because right, you know it's right. all tight yeah. shoulder rehab yeah and of course there's this girl that's tiny and petite next to me and she's throwing on the plates for the squat rack and she's just repping them through and i'm like god this is so embarrassing because i'm making more noise than she is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then man. then it got to be and i thought to myself no one cares what I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I'd like to think everyone think thinks a, they're right, looking at right. me, but the they probably didn't even know I was there. The struggle day, yeah. is real. You know, and look, for yeah. people that have gym intimidation, 
it, I mean, look, it is what it is. Russell's right that nobody cares. And even if they did, what, what does it possibly matter? It, yeah. I just thought that was funny, but at any rate, it is. yeah. So hard gainers don't, don't miss your, don't miss a, that new calorie goal. Get your protein in drink your calories. Another thing that worked for me. Yeah. So I was yeah. making these smoothies. I was putting Greek yogurt, you know, just whole fat Greek yogurt in there. Of course, protein powder. I'd throw some berries in there. I'd throw oatmeal or nut butter in there, make it really calorie dense. For me, that's a good way to get down some of those extra extra calories. And the last yep. thing I'll say for the diet side is to be patient. Certainly, that's one of the areas I, I fell down. <laughs> I was telling you my story about last year. I was that scale what budget? Damn it. I'll show that scale what's up. And I just ate like a pig. And of course, that didn't end well. But- what you're really looking for, and Russell, I'd love to hear your your take on this, but what I think an ideal amount of weight gain for, especially a hard gainer, when they're in a muscle building phase, it's a pound a month. And that's a tiny amount of weight, right? Yeah. Maybe a pound, pound and a half. And again, I'm talking about somebody who's resistance trained. If you are just starting out, if you're skinny fat, for example, you may well exceed that. But for somebody who's been training for a couple of years, a pound a month, so a quarter pound a a week is a is a sad, sad amount of weight when it comes to you know I want I want gains now I don't want them two years from now come on let's let's pack it on but as soon as you in my in my experience with myself and with clients as well as soon as we start to exceed that that kind of that pound a month pound and a half a month threshold certainly when we get to two pounds and more a month. We're seeing more fat come on, which look, a lot of bodybuilders, that's their MO, right? They dirty bulk. They just eat it all. They don't care. Look, I'll get up to 30% body fat. I don't care because I got the discipline to strip it all away. Yeah. A, they're younger. B, they're probably on gear, meaning they're taking drugs. And C, that's very, very unhealthy. They're doing that for an extreme aesthetic, not for longevity and health and to be healthy people. But has it been your experience working with hard gainers that slower is better when it comes to the weight gain? Yeah, Definitely. I'm I'm the one like you, one to three. That's one to my three. Real house. All right. You're you gonna know, coach it's me hard. on my next bulk then because I I like that it's, three number better than one. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Like you said, one pound a month is like. That's why I say th- it's these are the hardest people. Yeah, yeah, these are the hardest people because usually we all look at the scale for progress, which I think we've talked about many times. Right. So yes. I Not did. big. F- Good yeah. idea either, but. At least gives us a little like motivation, a little boost. Yeah. But I, I was my bulk this this winter, and I'm of the opposite. So I'm the you know look at food and I gain weight. So I have a real hard time bulking mentally. So I was averaging two to three pounds a month, and that's where I was. But what's funny is, of course, like the scale looking the way it did. You know, of course, I just want to add muscle and magically not put on weight, right? Like, that's yes, going to happen. me too. And then, but, <laughs> you know, you do have to do things like you do when you lose weight too. You have to say, all right, my pants are still fitting. You know, like there's right. going to be, those are all indicators like that you're putting on muscle. You're progressing in the gym. You know, your pants are, you know, they're going to be slightly tighter because you are filling yep. out, but not like, oh, you know, to the point where, we're putting on all fat, so yeah, dude. Um, I, I, I'll so, tell you what. I thank goodness for stretchy jeans these days. I guess all jeans have <laughs> some stretch in them. Because right around the new year, I was I was taxing mine. That's for that's for sure. I knew where my bulk was going good because I went to the Mind Pump event. They had a Christmas party in December. That's right. And yeah. I had to bring a suit. Thank the Lord, I tried the suit on because I had several suits. Those tops were. I knew the bulk was going good because the pants fit well, but the tops were just. My man, just ripping out of there, huh? I had to get yeah. one where I was a little heavier. I was like, oh, I was nice. heavier here. Let me put that one up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but I would have been, I would have gone to a mind pump thing looking slightly ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, right on. All right, well, as we're wrapping up here, my last piece of advice for hard gainers is this. I'll tell this to anybody, but for you hard gainers, this is critical, and it's sleep. Get your sleep. You're literally building your muscle in your sleep. You're not building muscle in the gym. You're actually breaking down muscle in the gym. You're not building it when you eat. You're refueling then. You are building your muscle specifically in those deep phases of sleep. So those healthy phases of restorative sleep. 
you're not going to have success putting on muscle as a hard gainer, really anybody else, but specifically if you identify as a hard gainer, you're really shooting yourself in the foot if you're not getting that healthy seven, eight plus hours of healthy sleep every single night. So I think that uh, in, in terms of our advice for hard, hard gainers, I'm going to leave it there. That's my last piece of advice is folks got, got to get the sleep for so many reasons, but specifically in our, what we're talking about here, the subject of today for that muscle building, get absolutely critical. I, it, yeah. Isn't it funny though? It's the same principles as losing weight, as gaining weight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Eat the nutrition you're supposed to be eating. Right. Get the sleep. Right. Have a goal, like have your workouts meet your goal. I right. mean, the same thing, right? The so, same the, yeah, same well, principles. Anybody listening to this, and especially for you, you folks out there that are in Russell's, that are in Camp Russell, right? You're like, oh, I hate these skinny fat people. Who are these people? Right. The all of everything we said here really applies for the most part, applies to you as well. I mean, this is yeah. all, this is the same advice to your point, Russell, that we would give anybody trying to be a healthy, fit, functional 56 year old, right? Yes. hundred percent. All right, Russell, man, I love having these conversations with you. Let's do this. Let's invite folks to continue the conversation with us. And folks, if you would like to continue this conversation, I'd love to hear from you if you're, especially if you're a hard gainer, or if you're if you're somebody who thinks that hard gainers are obnoxious, let's hear from you too. You guys can sound <laughs> off over in our private Facebook group. That's the Over 50 Lean Body Blueprint. I will put links to that into the show notes there. You have access to myself, of course, Coach Russell here. Our other coaches are in there. Uh, great community, growing community, thriving community. Love to have you in there and would really love to continue this conversation about, about hard gainers. So, Russell, until next time, I'm just going to sign off. I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Yeah. Okay, that's our show for today, folks. If you enjoyed this podcast, I want to let you know that we have other free resources over at silveredgefree.com. There you'll find our free guides with our top tips on nutrition, exercise, and healthy lifestyle to assist you in your weight loss and fitness journey. So feel free to head over there and download anything that looks useful to you. I'll put links to everything we talked about in the show notes, and you folks can find those over at silveredgefitness.com slash 277. As we wrap up our time together today, you can show your support for this show in two important ways. First is to tell a friend about this podcast and encourage them to give it a listen. The second is for you YouTube folks to click the like and subscribe buttons and for you podcast folks to please give this podcast a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on and be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss future episodes. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today and until next time, stay strong.